Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm just letting the last few guests in and don't worry, I'll keep an eye out. And so we'll go ahead and get started at 1107. So thank you so much for joining us this morning for Kuksa's Black Staff Leadership Panel. This is, I think, a terrific way to kick off Black History Month. And just to give some quick background, we know that UC has tremendous history as it relates to Black faculty, Black students, Black alumni, but I also think that our Black staff leaders have a tremendous legacy. And I will tell you, in my time leading on a local and system level, there are four names that constantly came up. And I feel so lucky and fortunate that we're able to have a shared conversation with them now. So before we have that conversation, I'm sure you're wondering, who am I? <laughs> so my name is Dennis McIver, pronouns he, him, his. I am the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging Program Manager at UC Office of the President. But before that, I was a past president of UCR Staff Assembly, a past chair of UCR's Black Faculty and Staff Association, and I'm fortunate to serve as chair of the Council of UC Staff Assemblies now. Before we get into the talk, I did want to quickly share our land acknowledgement, and I'll read it very quickly. The Council of UC Staff Assemblies recognizes that our service occurs on the unceded territory of the indigenous peoples of California, and that these lands were and continue to be of great importance to them. Every member of our community has and continues to benefit from the use and stewardship of these lands. With respect and gratitude, we acknowledge and make visible our relationship to the original caretakers. And we have a few resources we recommend that you check out if you'd like to learn more about that history. And it's also available on our website. So as far as some of the logistics for this meeting, this is being recorded for future use. We do ask that you keep your microphone muted during the event. This will be available for future viewing as well. This is meant to be a conversation. So although we do have some questions, I invite you, if you have a question that you're aching to ask, please feel free to pop it into chat. We're monitoring it. Or if you feel comfortable raising, standing up and raising your voice, do a hand raise and we'll make sure to bring you in. So let's talk about this panel. And I can tell you that I was telling everyone earlier that this is something I've been looking forward to having this conversation for months now. And so let's go ahead and introduce our panelists, starting with Regina Mathis, who serves as lead manager of learning and organizational development for UCLA's Campus Human Resources. Regina served as chair of the Council of UC Staff Assemblies during the 2016-2017 academic year. Prior to this, she served as president of UCLA Staff Assembly she has continued to do outstanding service both locally and system-wide. And for this cumulative effort, she was a Kevin McCauley Memorial Outstanding Staff Award recipient in 2019. Our next panelist who we feel very lucky to welcome back from retirement is Dave Miller. Dave Miller was a long-serving staff member of UCLA and a pioneer in staff leadership. In 2005, Dave was one of the first staff advisors to the regents and would go on to serve an additional year in the role to establish the rotation of the appointees, which still exists today. Dave served as chair of the Council of UC Staff Assemblies, as well as president of UCLA Staff Assembly. And in 2014, he would retire after more than 20 years of service to UC, and we're very excited to welcome him back for this conversation. Up next would be Dr. Loana Richmond, who serves as an organizational development and training manager. Her passions include empowering people, building trusting relationships, and connecting individuals' goals with objectives that serve the greater good. Loana's leadership includes a term as UC Staff Advisor to the Regents, Chair of UC San Diego Staff Association and Black Staff Association, as well as two years as a Cooksa Delegate. And perhaps most impressively, she did all of this while completing her doctorate in educational leadership at Cal State San Marcos and UC San Diego. Last and certainly not least is Jason Baldry, who serves as Assistant Dean of the Claire Trevor School of the Arts at UC Irvine. Jason has a long and distinguished leadership record at UCI, where he also earned his bachelor's and master's degree. He currently serves as the assistant dean, as I mentioned a moment ago, but previously served as director of technology for that school. In addition to this role, Jason served as a staff advisor to the regents, as well as chair of UCI staff assembly and a Cooksa delegate. So we'll go ahead and do a stop share now. And at this point, we have some questions, but I'm monitoring chat. If anyone has anything, pop it in, do a hand raise, and we'll just have an open conversation around this. So I wanted to start broadly with a question for all four of the panelists, starting with Regina. <laughs> and the question is, 
what is a leader to you? Uh, to me, a leader is someone who enables others to be and do their best, um, and that's individually and, and collectively, and it's doing that in pursuit of a common goal. Uh, so when I think about folks that I've seen in leadership positions, that's usually what I see. It's not just them shining, it's the other folks around them shining, and it's really being excited uh, as they work towards a vision. Thank you very much. We'll we'll do popcorn rules. Let's keep it interesting. So Regina, pass it to whoever you like. All right. Uh, let me hear from Luana. Um, so for me, a, a leader is um, someone who understands the responsibility that comes along with that privilege and models the behavior and character that they want um, to see emulated and also um, focuses more on the good of the group that they are leading, as opposed to someone who's managing in order to um, find ways to make themselves look good. And I will popcorn it to Jason. Thanks, Luana. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I think a leader to me is someone who chooses others before they choose themselves. Um, and, and chooses to serve. Because I think of leadership is not about um, doing for yourself, but doing for others. And so when you choose to serve someone else rather than yourself, that, that to me is what a leader is and what I aspire to be all the time. But sometimes I fall short and look at myself. <laughs> uh, I'll pass to Dave. <clears throat> I have no idea. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, no, I actually agree with everyone, but I would also focus on the fact that um, a leader is someone who uh, inspires uh, everyone around you. Um, and I think there's so much to be done. Uh, you have to include everyone's thoughts on how to move forward. And uh, that worked for me. And I, I've seen it several times and every one of you. And I think the inspiration piece is so such an important part of the leading. It's lighting that fire in other folks and bringing that potential out of themselves. So really, I think that's a really important point to think about. And speaking of inspiration, this next question is for Dave and Luana. And my question for you is, what inspired you to become leaders in the UC? We'll start with Luana. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, I think um, for me, really, it was, you know, a lot of times, especially when you're talking about service, as opposed to leadership. So, because I, I think that in, in the capacities that you're discussing, it was really more about service. Um, it was about seeing opportunity to make a difference and wanting to um, just do what I could to like influence things um, in a more favorable direction for the people that I had committed myself to serving. And for me, um, this is such an odd story. I was in a program that Regina knows very well called the Pro uh, Professional Development Program. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the year long cohort, you have uh, a presentation. And at the end of the presentation, uh, the person who was going to be the senior delegate from Cooksa said, would you be interested in becoming uh, a Kuxa delegate? And I said, what's well, Kuxa? <laughs> and I then got informed about uh, staff assembly and Kuxa. And I thought it was absolutely a fascinating and important thing for me to get involved in. That is kind of funny how it works too, where there's these past leaders and they say, you should do it. And it starts with a little curiosity and all of a sudden, six months later, you find yourself <laughs> waist deep in it. So, yeah. <laughs> and I love this idea of getting it that you just touched on, Dave. And that, that connects well to, I think, our next question, which is for Jason and Regina. And my question would be, 
when it came to this leadership and serving staff, can you describe the moment where you got it on terms of service and, and the work that you've done? Because I, I think there's a moment where it kind of hits everyone differently. For me, it was in a new staff orientation where I was talking about staff assembly and it just kind of clicked in that moment for me. And I, I wonder if, if Jason, Regina, if you'd share your got it moments. You know, I thought this was an interesting question, and and I don't know if I can pinpoint the the exact moment. I I joined UCLA from the private sector, so I didn't I wasn't really grounded in the um, uh, academia in the uh, educational environment. So I joined Staff Assembly because I was just trying to get a better understanding of the operations excuse me. Also, I'm an introvert. So I was like, okay, this is going to force me to at least go out and start to interact outside of my regular work. Um, next thing you know, I blink and it's seven years later and I'm chair of KUXA and what the heck happened? It's It, it was a weird indoctrination process. Um, but I think what really stu struck me as I interacted with folks in staff assembly and KUXA and the various organizations on campus was just the level of, of passion and commitment and care and energy that staff put into the university. I mean, it, it for regardless of all of the challenges, people were constantly going the extra mile. And, and what I saw was these organizations really spoke to the um, um, acknowledgement and appreciation that, that that I felt staff deserved for all of that. So it was more like, I see all the work they're doing. These organizations are a part to actually acknowledge that investment that they're making in the university. So how do we we match that? I don't know when it happened. It's just some all of a sudden, my, I started bleeding blue and gold and like, what, what, what in the world? Uh, but it was, it was just gradual meeting amazing people. Hmm. Yeah, that's... Um... I, you know, I, I guess I bleed blue and gold because I did my undergrad and grad here, but, but that wasn't the moment for me. It wasn't, it was, it was sometime later when I was, when I was working, uh, and it was probably around 10 years in when I, you know, I got frustrated. I got frustrated with looking at how complex and, and bureaucratic the organization is. And, and for the, the prior 10 years, I just said, oh, this is so crazy. This, why, why would anyone design a system to work this way? How does this support, you know, how do I feel good as an employee? And I, I realized in, at some moment that I was, I'd been complaining for 10 years and that I should do something rather than just complain. And so for me, that was the moment. I, again, like Regina, I don't know, remember the exact moment, but I realized, oh, complaining doesn't help. You have to go do something to make it better. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was the moment, I, although I have no idea when that was. <laughs> it can be hard, especially with the cumulative experiences. And sometimes you look, I think you look back and you just go, Okay, this is all makes sense. So I, so I do get the difficulty of saying, pick this exact moment where this happened for you. But thank you all for, for the effort to, to crystallize it. Now, I think one aspect of, the, of making the difference is the communications that happen with those that are higher up within our respective campuses and also system-wide. And so my next question is for everybody, whoever wants to jump in first is fine. And that is, can you speak to the man the experiences you had of working with these higher up leaders and also the experience of i guess managing up because i think that's one really critical piece of staff leadership that can be kind of difficult and all of you have been in these spaces whether it was the regents or uc president or senior leadership and so i hope i hope you could just share a little bit about your experiences of managing up and any insights you care to share and dave we'll start with you this time thank you um for me uh the interaction i when i started this whole process with kooksa of trying to create a role called staff advisor to the regents um it it was very challenging because obviously we had no template we had 
uh, no other leaders to look for. Um, and so my partner at the time, the, the staff advisor designate was Linda Brewer from UC Irvine. And this is long before Zoom. We were able to meet with regents one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one, uh, in their homes, in their businesses, et cetera, uh, to explain the goal and the mission of the staff advisor role and, and what importance it was for them to understand what contribution staff made. And uh, that was one of the things that really was uh, beneficial for me and for them, I would argue, uh, because their only contact with staff was uh, union uh, representatives. So this was going to be, in our minds, this was different. This was uh, speaking for all staff, um, not representing, but speaking, having a voice for all staff, um, represented in none. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, one of the things that started when I was the incoming Cooksa, uh chair, um, we started speaking up at all of the regents meetings, like every time we were going to one, it was like, okay, we're going to make a public comment, um, not just waiting for the major presentation at the end of the year. Um, but we still wanted to be strategic in, in that effort. And one of the things that we agreed to, um, excuse me, um, was to say something affirmative, but then offer the critique. And, and I think that's really part of managing up in general is expressing sincere appreciation for whatever you can, but also providing a constructive critique uh, and and data that supports. Look, this is what's broken, and this is how it's this is how it's going to help everybody if we fix this. And I do think that's part of managing up because it's it's hard for anybody here who's a manager. It's hard to just hear complaints all the darn time. <laughs> you do want to know that something's working, but you also need to know what's not working so that you can continue to make improvements. So I think that is part of managing up is considering is how you do that delicate dance of, you know, I like it here, but, you know, um, it, because both are important in order to move the organization forward and get support for whatever it is you're trying to make happen. So I wanna to add to that um, because um, both of our colleagues made some really good points. And um, one, in terms of their primary exposure being um, to people that were coming to the meetings during public comment. Um, and so a lot of that was um, angry and um, very, um, very specific. And I think it was important. Um, the other part is, um, we as staff all bring our expertise into the room. And so I think, you know, in my experience during a time as staff advisor, and I know Jason can definitely attest to it because I know they used, relied heavily on his expertise in um, technology during um, the cybersecurity issues, um, is to actually make it clear that, you know, we care about more than can we have better benefits and a promotion or more money, um, that we actually care about the institution and we have a unique perspective. Um, Shingo Lean, one of the um, continuous process improvement um, methodologies from Yuchi Jitsio Shingo was um, to improving the work is the work and the people who actually do the work are in the best position to have ideas about how to improve the work and pushing that forward in a way that is respectful and also demonstrates um, the importance of that point of view, I think is a big part of it too. I recently sat with a senior leader on my campus where we did like a wrap up of the year and she pointed out to me the programs and services she had greenlit on campus that were influenced by casual conversations that she and I had had that had given her insight um, into areas that she may not have considered otherwise. And I think that's a big part of 
um, showing added value um, so that it's not just, uh, you know, what can I get or what can I get for my people? Like, what can we do for the institution together really helps when you think about managing up. You know, I think um, you all touched on something that's that there's part of it is, you know, speaking truth to power, but not in a way that's confrontational, that doesn't always have to be that um, uh, aggressive approach. Um, and, and to me, the, the value of um, what someone said, uh, I'll borrow from that, yes and, uh, is, is a, such a great way of phrasing it. Um, uh, saying yes, and I see that this is where staff this is where the pain points that staff are experiencing is, and I think we can help here. I think that that, that yes and approach is so uh, helpful. Uh, so thank you to Ron Zizan, whose name I may have butchered. Yeah. Well, and I think somebody mentioned in the comment there about and taking action, and that's probably the other challenge in terms of managing up, because we can have a lot of conversations and kind of head nodding. Um, but it's the actual action on the next step. And sometimes that speaking, you know, to power is, yeah, you head nodded, but nothing's happening. So, and I think that's a lot of what happens with staff assembly and KUKSA is we keep trying to push a ball forward and the conversation is back to, okay, what's not happening? And so I do have a tip that I think is useful, and this could be useful for everyone. When we are talking about potential solutions or things that need to be fixed, um, the closer we are to actually presenting an actionable solution, mm -hmm. um, the more likely it is to be implemented because it's really hard for a person who has a set of priorities at this level to like stop and do the problem solving and reverse yeah. engineer the way to whatever the solution is that we're asking them to present. Mm -hmm. And I think you all just hit the nail on the head on, on so many different levels. And I, and I agree with the affirmation comment that was just placed into chat. But I think another piece sometimes that also gets, we have to balance it against is the temporary nature of the positions that we hold. Because if you're if you're a Kooksa chair, you've got a year. If you're a staff mm -hmm. advisor, you're a year. If you're a president, generally it's a year. So I think it's also having some component of connection to the organization so that they'll continue to move the needle forward. And so I think that's another piece that sometimes gets missed too, is that you can only do so much in 365 days. So hopefully the organization is in tune enough with that goal that they'll continue to find a way to move it forward. And also as folks who move on from these roles, we can help to move things in that direction, which my indirect commitment to next year when I'm past chair of KUKSA and could be stepping away, I'll, I'll find a way to stick around and keep it moving. <laughs> so oh, you, you think you're leaving the role? You, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. You never really leave, right? <laughs> and so I think that I really do appreciate the point that you, you've all raised there. And this brings me up to an, another question that I had, and it relates to tech, going back to the get it question. And I know we've done the managing up portion and also the getting it portion, but would any of you be willing to describe a moment where you helped someone, whether it was a senior leader or a regent, to get it. I know we heard one or one example or two already, but I didn't know if there are any other examples that anyone would would like to share. You know, I, the one I, I I like to share when I talk about this is a conversation I had with Regent Makarijian, who I was with uh, my, another staff advisor at the time, and we were talking to him about. Uh, we, we were trying to get them to understand the, the cost of turnover and how expensive that is and how and what we can do to make things better. And um, Sherry Main said something about how she had left from Irvine to take a new position at UC uh, San Diego, I'm oh, sorry, Santa Cruz. And, and he, he paused and said, wait, I don't understand. You applied for the job? And she's like, well, yeah, of course. He's like, well, why didn't you just transfer and take the job at UC Santa Cruz? And you know, we all know, I see smiles and nods. Like, that's not a thing. Um, you ha it, it's a new job. And even as a the regent whose job it is to oversee this massive enterprise um, and ensure the financials for the whole pension 
and for endowments and all of that, didn't understand the basic principle of how you get a job at UC. And <clears throat> so for me, that was such a moment of, I think I helped him get it to understand part of what it is to be a staff member at UC. Dave, I'm curious because you were in the um, advisor role for two terms, you know, just until we uh, until you were able to escape. Uh, but did you get did you get a sense that folks got it once you were done with the two terms? Because it, it I mean the great thing is that we do still have those advisors. Uh, I have to say that there are people who did get it. And there are people who had an agenda not to get it. Um, and, and unfortunately, those people will always be around. Uh, but what we have got to focus on is what our challenge is to uh, show the value of staff, to show that uh, in one of my speeches to the regents, I let them know that uh, unlike every other group uh, at the university, we're everywhere. We are on every room, every floor. We do, we make this operation happen. Mm -hmm. And without us, uh, we'd have a lot of people with, uh, who are highly educated uh, and with, not much common sense, quite <laughs> frankly. Um, and I think uh, that is one of the values I think that we bring to the university um, because we've got to have analytical skills. That's a given. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are many times when uh, people have tried to diminish who we were by saying we don't have soft skills. Mm -hmm. or we have soft skills, I'm sorry. And it's as if soft skills don't mean anything. But we would not network well if we did not have soft skills. Right. Um, there's so much involved with networking uh, effectively uh, because you then bring value to so many other people. I hope that that answers the question. Yeah. I, I've taken to calling so, them power skills as opposed to soft skills. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I Good. Good. really think they are so important um, in building relationships and connections. And, and you know, a lot of what happens here at the university is, is to go on that. Um, the bureaucracy, there's a lot of strings, <laughs> to, to, you know, as part of the organization, but it's really, can you pick up the phone and just talk to so-and-so and get the answer and, and keep it moving? And, you know, I would also say, um, when I came from the private sector as well, and, you know, in a corporate structure, you absolutely understand everyone's roles and responsibilities, but that's not necessarily the case I found at the university. Mm -hmm. And in fact, power can reside in a title called administrative assistant. Yep. And you must know that. You've got to be aware that it's not just uh, dealing with, you know, the upper, uh, the leadership of the university or the, the campus, but it's, it's getting a sense of what value and what power others have other than those people. Yeah, and you know, speaking of that, relationships are like critical. Um, you know, we have people who have been at our institutions, many of them for decades, mm -hmm. um, and that th that's the shortcut. I mean, that's like the um, you know understanding how to connect with people, and not like those relationships where you pass out business cards and you don't actually have a conversation with the person, right. um, because when you pull out the business card six months later or a year later, um, they may or may not remember meeting you. Um, but and also relationships they're not built on um, that are not transactional not you know I'm going to do you this favor because I'm gonna need a favor from you later but just genuine authentic like meetings of the mind where we understand each other because when a person um, 
you know, there's a book Stephen Covey's son wrote um, called The Speed of Trust. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely true that when people trust each other, um, being able to connect and um, make things happen is much faster because you don't have to do a lot of black background explanation. You can call someone and say, you know, what is the secret sauce to put on this burger so that I can feed people lunch in five minutes and they can give you the recipe without, you know, having to, you know, have you sign an NDA and go through a background check. I think that's also where knowing those key players, many of whom have been around for a long amount of time and understand how all the pieces fit becomes critical. And the point that was raised earlier reminded me of this tweet that I saw where it said something like at every university, there's a administrative assistant too that's been around for 25 years and runs everything. And so I think that, and I think that's the truth that there are understanding who those folks are, paying respect to what they bring and really engaging as partners, I think is just a, a critical element of being able to be successful on our on our different campuses and locations. This does bring up a question that actually came up in chat that I wanted to share with everyone. And it is the question of difficulties. And so the question specifically is, have you faced any obstacles during your journey of doing leadership? I'm sure we all have examples and I can draw on some too. <laughs> But I'd like to start. I'd like to start with you, Jason, if, if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, sure. I, I, I wrote a little bit in the, about this in the chat. Um, in response, I think for me, the 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 challenge that I faced most often was seeing, oh, you're an IT person, okay, and that's your ceiling. That I didn't have any management skills. I didn't have any ability to go beyond just being. Uh, the IT guy, uh, and that that was one uh, a challenge um, that was almost as challenging as as the color of my skin in many ways. Because once they see you that way, it's so hard to get them to see you any other way. Um, took a lot of effort, a lot of time to break through that. And I don't have a secret sauce on how you do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you just brought to mind, though. I mean, part of of breaking through any obstacle is is persistence, right? It's it's, it's remaining focused on the the goal. Um, it's also recognizing that it, it's all a process. Like life is a process. So as much as we want it to happen overnight, uh, sometimes what you have to do is what's the incremental progress that I can make? What's the one step that I can make? Maybe I haven't sold this person yet, but if I can go and sell this person on the idea, okay, I've, I've at least got somebody else who's championing it with me. So it's, it's I think, um, adjusting our need to have things instantly. And I'm not saying that's always wrong. Sometimes it is like, you know, why is it taking 10 years to get X, Y, Z done? I've got a few of those items on my list. Um, but it is, that's the that's the reality of it. Um, limited resources, limited time, et cetera. How do I keep it on folks' radar screens? And what are the small wins that I can get to continue to move the initiative forward? And um, but the I, one of the first things is recommitting to the goal. Like, is it still the right goal? But sometimes the timing just isn't right. So, okay, let me reassess. All right, I can do this much of it. And you keep coming back to it if, in fact, the, the goal or aspiration makes sense. And the other piece is, you know, what's your resilience practice? What, what do you need to do to kind of like buck up, you know, recommit? You know, and, it, you know, it may be something as, you know, wonderful as like, I'm going to go take a hike, or it might be, let me get that Ben and Jerry's carton right now, just to kind of get me through the moment. Whew. All right, take a breath, dive back in. So I, I think for me, probably, um, you know, similar um, to what Jason mentioned about, like, people wanting to put you in a box, um, you know, probably my... Um, greatest challenge is um yeah that that of defined description i have a lot of interests and i do a lot of different things and so um yeah absolutely um people 
you know, there's some people who um, still think back to when I was a um, business systems analyst and they still want me to, um, you know, do tech support. And then there are people who um, remember when I was a financial analyst, and they want me to help them with their grants. I mean, it's, you know, I think one of the things I learned at the um, Wakuba, uh, Wakuba um, Business Management Institute at um, UC Santa Barbara, um, you know, they, they cover a lot. I, it was like a, a university class on universities. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that I learned was having breath. So being, um, having, being skilled and um, fluent in a bunch of different areas um, is a strength um, until people think they need a specialist. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I said all that to say, um, you know, the um, people start with the uh, master of, uh, what is it, a master of many trades, it, you know, the jack of all trades, um, master not, of none kind of thing, the yeah. master of none, mm -hmm. but they miss the other part of it where it's still far better than a master of one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to actually do a, a shameless plug for Lawana as well. I was just talking about, you know, your your resilience practice what energizes you because this all of this work can be a grind. Um Lawana um has done a lot of work in terms of afrofuturism. She's got conferences that she puts on. She has other outlets also to help energize her and bring her back into the fray. So I'm going to shameless plug look up afrofuturismlounge.com. She's got a conference coming up, so y'all look into into that work as well. And we, I think, we have to recognize the balance that's that's important to to keeping us going. Thank you. <laughs> see, I know you wouldn't say anything. I wasn't. <laughs> you see, I have a list here of everything I was going to mention. Virginia, you just stole my fire. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but that's all right yeah, because we can talk about the dream tank if you want later. <laughs> See, now that this has been mentioned, we're going to have to come, come back to that. But but yes, I think any opportunity we have to kind of have that balance and that uplifting, I think, is important. One piece that I wanted to throw in about even how do we navigate the challenges is also the strength of your community that is supporting you with this work. Because I think with leadership, it's such a grind. And sometimes it's a very one person sort of experience very individual and we all kind of deal with it differently but i think having a space of affirmation whether it's your friends who understand it or your colleagues who are in the work with you and really building and protecting that space i think is very important as well and i'll tell you even in my year as chair i probably i probably pontificate and complain to a few select people on a pretty much weekly basis, but I think that's really important because you need to be able to refill the cup and having spaces to do that, I think is is very important. And shout out to Afrofuturism Lounge. I am been a big fan and you can see all this stuff. If you Google it, a bunch of stuff comes up, I promise you. <laughs> and so I did wanna circle back on, I know we had a couple other questions and I'm sensitive to time. <laughs> One question that did come up was that the university is often a stay in your lane organization and how does one blur the line in the lane? I have feelings about this, so I feel compelled to say something, but I, I think the key piece is, especially as it relates to staff, and we talked about this a little bit before, but it's to remind folks of the contributions that staff do make to the space that, yes, we talk about and you see teaching research and service, but who's the glue that's helping to keep all those things together and sometimes it's a matter of reminding them that, yeah, those are important, but we're but as staff, we're supporting all of those things. Mm -hmm. And just reminding them that that presence, if it's gone or if it's not appreciated and it goes away, then that's going to create problems too. So I think it's just reframing what contributions we make is an important part. But I'd invite anyone else who wants to contribute as well to that question. So I want to say respectfully. <laughs> um, one is that you approach it respectfully because you don't want to get into a clash of the egos um, with anyone. Um, it's just not worth it. And it, it doesn't usually end well. Um, but beyond that, a lot of it is about what is your commitment? Because we're all here, we have jobs, we have um, tasks and responsibilities um, that need to be completed. And so it's really about demonstrating your ability to meet all of your obligations, um, do them well and do them on time while still also doing these other things. 
And for some people, it doesn't translate because, you know, most people, they want to work eight hours and go home and go do whatever and not work, you know, and then some of us don't know when you're supposed to stop working. So we want to get the thing done. And if there are other things we want to get done, even though there are only 24 hours in a day, we still get them done. And um, it's how we're wired. And yes, the resilience practices are important, but it's about you finding out what your balance is and how you demonstrate that competency and build that um, confidence and trust it goes back to trust so that when you do um, blur the lines, um, it's not seen as a threat to whatever it is um, people's expectations are of you. You know, I, I the the stay in your lane phrase is one I, I don't I always dislike it because, um, well, the lane is so wide, it doesn't really matter. Um, I always felt that, you know, bringing your expertise to, to bear is so important on different questions. How can you bring in a different point of view onto whatever the topic is? You know, and for me, coming from an IT background, it was, okay, you're talking about HR, but here's where IT could fit in here. Here's how this can, you know, find ways to get out of your lane by reminding people that you have a, a, an opinion that matters on whatever is being discussed and you don't so you don't have to stay in the lane as it were um, and i think that's broadly uh, true especially for staff for staff for the staff advisor program is we all have our areas of expertise but I can still bring something to bear and staff can bring something to bear on all conversations within the university because the administrative assistants know everything and have the power in certain circumstances. So I think, you know, your lane is also your strength is what I would say. Dave, what are your thoughts? Um, I actually, um, what, what Jason is saying resonates with me. Uh, I have been in as a black man, and I know I look very small on the camera, but I'm a big black man. And I've been in meetings where I'm the only black face at a very high level meeting. And it's as if I'm not in the room. The expertise that I bring to the room wasn't wasn't recognized. And I think what's important is for us to know our value, to know what we know, and be clear on that, and know when and how to use our voice, uh, when to be uh, the one in the room to say something unlike anyone else, uh, and to bring the knowledge from of your own and the network that you have across your campus and the system. That's one of the joys actually being at Puxa because you do have a network of people across the system you can tap into. Um, so I, I just think it, it opens people's eyes when you actually uh, make yourself recognized in a meeting uh, and you bring value to it. And so I saw a comment about, um, you know, resources on how to be appropriately assertive. It's really going to depend because, you know, it's it's it, a lot of this is personality driven. Um, there are people who want you to like just be straight, direct, and say what you need to say, mm -hmm. and there are other people who really um, don't respond well to assertiveness. Some pe I've, I've been in situations where people felt attacked just because their methodology was questioned. And it wasn't a question of integrity, it was a question of like wanting to understand how they arrived at whatever conclusions they were presenting and that was considered an attack. So it's, there's not a right answer for that. That's where like, you know, the so-called soft skills really are power skills and understand how to read the room and read the situation is um, gonna be your greatest asset because knowing when you say the right thing at the wrong time, it's sometimes worse than saying nothing. 
I think one yeah, important think skill though is 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 listening. It's asking often it's not making the right statement, it's asking the right question. Mm -hmm. right? Yes. And that's what will cause somebody to think about a situation a little bit differently or reflect on their approach. Um, and then that might give you the opening to assert yourself and offer additional information. But the first thing is, I'm sorry, the first thing is asking the question and then listening to the answer. Because sometimes we skip that. We're stuck in our zone and we're not really hearing the subtext to whatever the person is saying. And that, I think that's where it's a constant practice too, and it requires, it can't just have boilerplate solutions to those because folks respond to truth and how it's being presented differently. So it really being sensitive to that. And look, I, I always try to look at it from the perspective of what can we do to build this relationship and how do I need to adjust to keep that relationship strong? But I think if you're willing to walk in with that and also be willing to balance the truth with diplomacy, I think if you can do those two things, it helps a lot. And a big piece of it, too, is the integrity of who's saying it. Mm -hmm. So I think operating in integrity and truth is, is honestly some of the best things you can do when it comes to being assertive. I do see it's 1153. And I've learned never to get in the way of attendees getting paid or folks getting lunch. And so I did want to start to conclude things. And so I guess my last question for all of you would be this. When it comes to, let's take a step back to when you were first held your first leadership role and you get to see yourself. If there's one thing you could tell yourself on the day one that you started doing this type of work, what would it be? And Dave, I'm going to start with you. Oh, my God. Um, I would say that my responsibility is to involve as many, many people as possible to get as many thoughts uh, as possible gathered and then to, uh, to try to find a way to create a path to involve people who are not at all connected with our agenda. I'm going to pass it over to Luana next. <laughs> all right, I was writing notes. So um, I keep saying the word trust, right? Because it's just really an effective um, approach to everything. And so I, I think I would tell myself to trust my team and to delegate more. Um, in the beginning, in your early days as a leader, you think you have to do everything. And not only do you not have to do everything, you don't have to solve every problem or have the, have the answer to every question. And understanding that earlier actually helps you to be more effective and go farther. Thank you very much. All right, Jason, you're up next. You know, I think for me, I would say that the first time I would thought of myself as a leader, um, I think I made the mistake of feeling like I was done, um, mm -hmm. of feeling like, okay, now I'm a leader. Uh, and so what I would tell myself is, no, no, you got to keep learning. You have to keep going. It's not over yet. Just because you've gotten to the position where you think you were trying to get, you still have more to learn uh, and to keep learning how to be a better leader. All right, Regina, the last word is yours on this one. I I love everything that everybody was saying, and I think I, I'll draw a little bit from everybody. Um, I, I would tell myself that being a leader is about facilitating and advocating. It's like my role is to make it as easy as possible for my team members to do their, their jobs um, and to move obstacles and advocate for them uh, uh, appropriately. Um, excuse me, that also includes telling the truth as well. So it, all of that is maintaining integrity in that process. And the other piece with that um, bridges on to what um, Jason just mentioned is recognizing that you're probably never going to be there. So there's this interesting balance of helping people see the vision and what you're trying to create. But there's always a, a sense of, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? And in that process, you're growing and evolving and paying attention to the context of the organization and just be open to that growth um, and 
the open to the information that you get back from the people on your team. Recognize it; it's it's all reciprocal. It's all connected. Um, so long-winded answer to, I'm still working on it. <laughs> Well, I'll say this, if I had a chance to go back and talk with all of you on day one, the thing I would say is that you may encounter peaks and valleys, but you'll reach the destination. And I want to thank you, all four of you sincerely for the leadership that you've had in your different roles. And I think a lot of the work we've been able to do began with the sacrifices the four of you made. So thank you for your time and your service. And I feel like we're we're stronger as a system because of the work that you've done. So thank you all for sharing this time with us. As we close out, I did want to share a few things for everybody. I'll pop it into chat, but we'll go ahead and do a quick screen share as well. But looking to the rest of Black History Month, there are a few things I wanted to spotlight for everyone. The first thing is that we have a lot of stuff happening system-wide at all of our different locations. I encourage you to check those out and engage as much as you can. And we made a little bit.ly link for you to go to the UCNet article, so please check that out. On February 24th, we are going to see a system-wide town hall with President Michael Drake, as well as the current staff advisor and staff advisor designate. I'm sure many of y'all turned in questions, so I encourage you to check that out. That'll be on February 24th from 11 a.m. to 12.30. And then finally, February 27th and 28th will be the UC Black Administrators Council Conference. As far as that's concerned, my understanding is some of that will be streamed. Really encourage you to take advantage and check that out. And that will be on UC's YouTube page. And thank you all for joining us. I can tell you I'm leaving this conversation feeling moved and inspired. And I'm appreciative that, yeah, we had 138 people, but folks were around that whole time. And that speaks to the power of the conversation. So thank you all for taking the time to engage and be a part of this. And please enjoy and celebrate Black History Month, especially in the spirit of everything that's happened. And make sure you're watching out for each other and celebrating the work we do together. So. Thank you all. Have a wonderful How about lunch. Thank you to day. Dennis. Thank you so much for coordinating all of this, Dennis, and the great work that, that you are doing um, for all of the many organizations you're a part of at this point. Um, we're never letting you go. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your leadership, Dennis. <laughs> thank you, Dennis. Thank you for reaching out, Dennis. Well, thank you all so much. And that, that warms my heart. And I appreciate y'all so much. And everyone take care. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Hey.